Well, I'll say we stay standing while we have words from Rabbi Aaron Goldstein, please. This period of time for Jews is called the time, Days of Awe. It begins with Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and ends with Yom Kippur, a fast day. Most Jews think that the fast day, 24 hours, 25 hours, depending on which branch of Judaism you follow, is the most serious of days, but actually it's the reverse. Rosh Hashanah marks the start of a time of reflection, of personal time, considering one's own value in this world. Before we get to the end of these days of awe, when perhaps we might hope that God may forgive us and we may move forward and gain atonement, first we have to go to our fellow human beings and talk to them about the things that we may have done to wrong them or that we could have done better. The most important conversations are, of course, with the ones closest to us, the people who we really love, and to actually bear our souls and to be very honest. When we do so, we begin to understand a little bit about the value of our own individual lives. Already from my first interaction, coming into the car park to meeting uh, the new mayor, and I find people have value, people who are giving their time, just as each one of you are, to the local area that you love. I sincerely thank you for that, for all that you bring to this area. I hope that you understand your worth and your value and are able to help each individual citizen in this borough to understand their meaning and worth as well. We all matter. Those of you who have heard me before say that know that I don't really do so much of the prayer stuff. But just a final thought. We say from a Spanish and Portuguese background tradition, may things always get better for you, never worse. And may the light of the creator, whether you believe in an actual creator or however you think it started, it was awesome, always shine upon you. Move on to agenda item one. Apologies for absence. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I have a number of apologies. Councillors Duncan, Graham, Hurunji, Kaufman, Lewis, Markham, Milani, Seaman Digby, Singh, and Stead. Thank you for that. Uh, minutes, uh, members, we all agree on those? You've had time to read them? Thank you. Any declarations of interest? Sorry, Councillor Mathers. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I wish to declare a non pecuniary interest relating to motion 9.4 due to my employment as stated in the register of interest. I will leave the meeting during the debate. Thank you. Right, we go on to my announcements. Isn't it encouraging to see that we're now all back in a chamber sitting next to each other? I can see all the smiles. Well done. Myself and the mayoress, we attended a tea dance on the forecourt of the Civic. This was arranged by the Fascinage Trust and the council. And it was, listen to the opinions of our, it was in it for the elderly, so I was included. And they said how fantastic it was to be shaking hands once again, sitting down over a cup of tea and having a chat. And Lynn Summers, she even managed to get me up and have a dance as well, which was quite an achievement. But I still urge everybody to make sure who have not had their vaccine to take this up. This is absolutely essential to add this additional protection in managing this disease. So I urge anybody who hasn't had it to please take it up. I was extremely honored also to lay a wreath at the weekend on behalf of all the residents of Hillingdon 
at the Polish War Memorial. And talking to a veteran who was in his 20s and now he's at the young age of 99, when I asked about his experiences, he said, I was just doing my job. He was so modest to the point that when we were going to a reception, he asked me to go first because he thought I was more important. I put him correct there pretty quickly. I said, we're not fit to tie your shoelaces, sir. We'd had a fantastic Spitfire flyover as well. And people who, you can imagine how we went through this war with the technology that we had. And another thing he mentioned to me was he goes, there was no guarantee I was going to come back home. And he spent a bit of time in the memorial gathering his thoughts, thinking about all his colleagues who did not come back. Along with the same theme, I think it's really is worth remembering and mentioning our brave troops who were sent to Afghanistan. They were just doing their jobs. For the ones who've come back, and a special mention for the ones who perished. Another group of people who went around their own, doing their own business but never came back that day, who went to work, was doing the 9-11 attacks. Atrocious. We mustn't forget that. It's been nearly 20 years tomorrow. We've got to remember how precious life is. This morning, we celebrated Emergency Services Day. I must thank the leader for instating this wonderful occasion. And next year, it will be bigger and better. I think it's crucial that we all remember what an important role our emergency services play. I'm reading, going to read a few lines from the prayer which I delivered which I think is apt. We pray for those who serve in the emergency services, that you protect those whose service is our protection. We recall those who have paid the ultimate price in the task of preserving life and upholding law and order. They're just doing their jobs. On a more local point, I expect everybody to go down to our Lido in Gatting Way. It is now heated. The residents that have come back, wow, we did not know. It is worth going. It is fantastic. I was at the London Youth Games, and I'm proud to announce that our girls' team won medals in hockey and netball, which I think I played part of coaching them, helping them out there. I was very vocal, and they got sent off. And our boys won bronze in the football, which was... Fantastic to see these youngsters. And from these youngsters who play in these games have grown up, we've seen internationals come from these games. So the discipline that they play under, and really, there was no foul play when you watched them. There was a lot of decent games there, and they was played hard, but fairly. I think the seniors could learn from that. And finally, I want to mention, special mention for Natasha Baker, who once again, in the Paralympics, has delivered... She's brought back a silver for us in the dressage. And previous last time is gold, but you know, she had a new horse, so I just want to say a big thank you to her. And that's and that's my announcements. We now move on to agenda item five. Uh, there's only one, so I believe we can ask if is that noted? Good. Okay, we go into agenda item six now. Uh, Councillor Lavery. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, agenda item uh, six is to propose uh, an article four direction to remove permitted development rights for commercial uh, and business premises uh, in certain specified locations of the borough. Uh, there are two recommendations on uh, page 15 of the council papers, um, and they are that the assistant director of planning and regeneration be instructed to make a non-immediate article four direction an indicative implementation date of September 2022 to remove Part 3, Class MA, permitted development rights 
in limited geographic areas as set out in paragraph six of the report and mapped on appendix one and that the assistant director of planning and regeneration be authorized to prepare the article four direction and instructed to carry out all necessary consequential arrangements to give effect to recommendation one which will include publishing the making of the direction seeking representations on the direction notifying owners and occupiers and the Secretary of State as well as any further evidence. Um, just by way of background, this is um, necessary, um, we, we believe, um, to protect um, our high streets in particular from the new uh, permitted development rights which uh, if, we, if we don't bring in the Article 4 could leave us in a position where we um, don't get controlled development or controlled reductions and we actually lose the hearts of high streets. Um, so um, I move the recommendation. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Yes, may I second and reserve my rights? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Is that agreed? We're going to agenda item seven. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I rise on this occasion in my capacity as the Vice Chairman of the Council's Audit Committee. Um, as you can see, um, item uh, seven is that the annual report of the Audit Committee for the year 2020 to 2021 uh, is noted. Um, the Audit Committee, while not necessarily the most high profile committee in this Council, uh, is an incredibly vital committee. Uh, the importance of an independent audit function is integral to the good governance of this council um, and it's very important that the committee has uh, a good working relationship with both the internal and external audit functions. Um, I'd like to just pay tribute to our independent chairman, uh, John Cheshire, uh, I'd also like to thank uh, my predecessor, Councillor Goddard, and also thank all other members of the committee who've served over the last year, along with all the officers and all the professional audit staff who have been involved in uh, producing this report. Um, therefore, I'd like to formally move the report. Do we have a second for that? Councillor Morgan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, uh, I formally second the recommendation and withheld my right. Councillor Egerton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Being the longest-serving member of the audit committee, I hope that the comments which I'm going to make will be helpful for everybody present. As the vice chair of the committee has mentioned, it is a statutory requirement. And on a positive note, we certainly have been fortunate in having a very professional and experienced independent chair in John Cheshire. However, the number of elected members on the committee is lower than on any comparable local authority. There were just four of us. And it seems one is effectively ex officio, having for the last 10 years been the chief whip of the administration. Quite honestly, the abilities and experience required for the two positions are not the same. Both are important posts, I accept, but my view is that it is essential that members of the Audit Committee have the necessary commitment, independence and inquiring mindset to provide the required challenge. I should add that the former councillor and freeman of the borough, George Cooper, was in my opinion such a knowledgeable and worthwhile member and he was on that committee for quite some time. The next concern is the failure of members of the committee to attend, and worse, even to provide a substitute. This is both discourteous to the independent chair and to officers who are presenting reports, but also risks the operation of the committee. At the last two meetings of the committee, one after the report had been prepared, had I left the meeting, it would have been in quorate. Indeed, to keep the quorum, I was encouraged, or no, threatened, to be tied to the chair, to my chair, so that the quorum would be maintained. 
I have to share with you, Mr. Mayor, it's quite often that I'm encouraged to leave meetings more than being required to stay. <laughs> so, to summarise, can I ask that consideration is given to increase the number of members of the Audit Committee and for all of us in this chamber to appreciate the importance of the committee. Thank you. Councillor Goddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I would like to uh, thank Councillor Eggington for his uh, uh, steadfast endeavours in keeping the uh, Audit Committee afloat through times of difficulty. <laughs> Much appreciated. I want to deal in particular with the concern about the role of the Chief Whip as the Vice Chairman of this committee. I think it's absolutely incorrect to refer uh, to Councillor Flynn as ex officio. That is not what he actually is. Councillor Flynn is the Chief Whip. Okay? Uh, he is invited to attend Cabinet meetings, but he is not entitled to vote or to participate in any of the executive functions that fall to the cabinet. If you look at the guidance, and I emphasize that it is guidance that is given by SIPFA, um, then I would suggest that it is actually necessary um, to interpret guidance in the circumstances that we face. So Councillor Flynn does not have executive responsibilities. Uh, he has very effective uh, and relevant experience and knowledge of the process that we're going through. Uh, internal audit, external audit, and the operations of the audit committee are vital to this, and it's something that we rely on very much. It is very important indeed that we have a demonstrably independent and vigorous audit committee, uh, and it is certainly not the case that Councillor Flynn is incapable of, of uh, uh, conducting that. Uh, so I'm reminded that uh, when I was going through my professional training, and I'm sure that Councillor Eggington went through the same thing, uh, we were told that uh, to be an auditor is to be a watchdog, not a bloodhound. And I would suggest that perhaps Councillor Eggington is sleeting a little bit of blood here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Morgan? You reserve your right. No? Okay. Councillor Flynn? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to, to formally move the uh, recommendation as per the order paper. Is that agreed? Thank you. We're now going to agenda item eight, uh, Councillor Tuckwell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can the Cabinet Member for Environment, Housing and Regeneration please update me on the progress of the rollout of the separate food waste collection service and how this will contribute to the Council's climate change plan? Councillor Lavery. Mr Mayor, and, and thank you to Councillor Suckwell for, for your question. Um, in May of this year, we launched um, for the first time a separate collection service to collect food waste separately um, from garden waste. And that's important because previously um, you could only do food waste if, if you had garden, garden waste collection, which really meant you probably lived in a house. Um, when it was launched, we have had approximately 30,000 households uh, taking part. Um, we've now got some 39,000. It is important that we continue to make progress because it is estimated that the gases produced from food waste account for 10% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. And certainly in 2019, when we did some research in Hillingdon, some 40%, 40% of black bag waste was actually food. Um, so this has a, a kind of double benefit. A, if you start to separate it out, um, people understand how much they're throwing away, which may also um, encourage them to uh, have less waste, which is also very helpful, um, but it also enables it uh, to be processed separately. The, the additional benefit um, from not composting it, which is effectively where we were, 
is that we don't release the gases from the decomposing food into the air. It's processed at a plant in Surrey, uh, and as a byproduct of this, it, it generates gas and electricity, which is useful. And in due course, it is the aim is that the, the, some of the products coming back will enable uh, the vehicles to be fueled in a low carbon way. Um, so we are making uh, good progress, um, and um, I, I thank the councillor for his question. Do we have a supplementary? I do, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And thank you to Councillor Lavery for your initial response. My supplementary question is, what plans do you have to expand the service? Councillor Lavery. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. As I said in my initial answer, um, the service was only available to those originally in houses. <laughs> now, the Council um, Waste Services team, and many of you have, I'm sure, attended their roadshows, I have been doing a great deal of promotional work and my thanks to them across the, the summer in promoting this service, which is enabling more of those who could already have taken the service to actually do so. Um, and we, we look forward to that growing and there will be more roadshows to come. The, the, the big gain here will be expanding the service to all types of property within Hillingdon, um, including uh, the slightly easier ones will be um, flats, small blocks of flats and masonettes. Um, we will require to do more work and we will do more work on our larger flatted developments because we, um, we would aim to, to get it collected there as well. Um, so those, those are, uh, that, that is the work we want to do. And the, the, the thought I'd like to leave you all with is do you all have food waste recycling yourselves? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you for that, Councillor Lavery. Uh, Councillor Gardner. Um, can the Cabinet member confirm that the Hillingdon Youth Council has continued to be a voice for the young people in the borough despite the pandemic? Can she also say how many schools in Hayes are involved in the initiative? And if the case is that the young people in Hayes are underrepresented, what steps are planned to increase this number so that the membership of the Youth Council can effectively represent the whole borough? Thank you. Councillor O'Brien. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor, and I thank Councillor Gardner for asking a question regarding the Hillingdon Youth Council. The Youth Council is a representation of young people aged between 11 and 19 and up to 25-year-olds for those with special educational needs who live, study or work in the borough. Membership of the Youth Council gives young people the chance to discuss relevant issues, engage with decision makers and contribute to improving the lives of young people within their community. It also helps to develop their skills, knowledge of issues and hot topics, confidence and empowers young people along with making new friendships. There are currently 18 active members with representation from the following schools, Bishops Holt, Dowey Martyrs, Hayden, Merchant Taylors, Oakwood, Ryslip High and Swakeleys. Despite lockdown, the Youth Council remained active, holding meetings virtually and having physical meetings where possible. I had the pleasure of attending one of their meetings in June of this year, whereby I met nine of the members. We had a Q&A session followed by a quiz and a debate. And so a very useful couple of hours of my time with a very impressive group of young people. I also have a quote from one of our Youth Council members. During lockdown, I found the virtual HYC meetings to be a window into the world. It's a place where I am welcome, my views are heard, and I can have a deep discussions and debates with my friends. The work of Hillingdon's Youth Council has actively sought to make a difference and engage with and secure the views of a wider and representative range of young people from across the borough. <coughs> this has included surveys on current issues, and those that matter to them, including domestic violence, knife crime reduction, and the voice of the child and young people in Hillingdon, and the environmental issues of recycling and waste. The Youth Council works in partnership with the UK Youth Parliament, and I had the pleasure of meeting our two young UK young parliamentarians, Isra and Mariam, just before lockdown. Two intelligent young women giving their time to represent Hillingdon. In addition, we have two members on the London Youth Assembly, one being the Deputy Chair. 
Fountains Mills is currently the home of the Youth Council. However, I would like to consider with the agreement of the Youth Council a move to the Civic Centre and if I can pull it off even into this chamber. Any young person who's interested can find out about the Youth Council and the relevant officers' teams will once again at the start of this new academic year promote and forge links with school councils in a bid to increase representation from all schools across the borough. In our recent youth survey, 80 young people said they would be interested in knowing more about the Youth Council, so this is extremely positive. I hope this evening this question has raised awareness and piques the interest of the young people of Hayes and the surrounding areas. In addition, when councillors go into their wards, they too could raise awareness of the important work that is being carried out by our dedicated Youth Council. Thank you for that. Uh, do we have a supplementary, Councillor Gardner? I do indeed. Um, therefore, would it be possible for you to encourage, which I was going to say insist, who are the people responsible for organising uh, the members of the Youth Council to make actual physical contact with the students in the schools in the Hayes? I'm sure we, we would all be interested to hear the views of the students, for example, from the Global Academy, who witnessed one of their classmates being stabbed to death in June. Um, perhaps they would be able to explain their worries and fears about the environment they're growing up in, and maybe we could learn the answers that they give us. Councillor O'Brien. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Gardner, for raising that, um, and that, that extremely sad incident that happened uh, just before the summer. Um, yes, of course, um, our youth teams work with, and they, we also have the Pan 16, the, the over 16 teams as well. Um, that, that will be going in and will once again start to promote um, the, the Youth Council. Um, what, I, what I can say though that with that incident the Global Academy took very exceptional measures and worked very very well with their students so with the help of schools and the promotion of the Youth Council yes I would very much like to hope that they are able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McQuana. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Could the Cabinet Member please update Council on the number of school places offered to primary and secondary pupils in Hillingdon this academic year? Councillor O'Brien. That's very exciting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I thank Councillor McQuana for asking the question on the primary and secondary school places offered for this new academic year 2021-2022. Hillingdon Council continues with its strong track record of offering school places to our resident children and young people every year, and this is no different. This year is no different. We continue to put families first with ongoing investment in our school building and expansion programme to ensure our children get the best start in life. Hillingdon has successfully delivered one of the largest school expansion programmes in London, remaining ahead of the rising demand for primary and secondary school places over the last 15 years. Education remains a top priority for the Council, and with this administration's sound financial management, the Council's £154 million school building and expansion programme is helping to meet the future needs for places whilst ensuring that children have access to high quality educational facilities. This summer, Hillingdon successfully offered and processed, based on the position at National Offer Day, 3,664 primary reception school places. That is 226 less than the previous year. This sector's applications have decreased by 6.72% across London and Hillingdon has experienced a 5.7% decrease. The good news is that 99.3% of children were offered one or of their preferred primary school places, and 93.7% of children were offered their first preference, rating Hillingdon second within London, the London boroughs for giving parents their first preference choice, well above the London average of 87.3%. The Pan-London Admission Scheme analysis reported that Hillingdon had the sixth highest number of applications and preferences for reception places this year, compared to seventh highest last year. In addition, this, su this summer Hillingdon successfully offered and processed, based again on the Pan-London um, the, the Pan position and na on National Offer Day, 
3,607 secondary transition to year seven school places. This is 107 uh, pupils less than last year. There's been a 0.4% increase in applications across London, with Hillingdon experiencing 3% decrease. This coincides with an increase of elective home education requests, which occurred during the, the pandemic. Once again, the good news is that 94% of children were offered one of their preferred secondary school places. Hillingdon remains the top West London borough, beating the London average of 93% and 67% of children were offered one of their first preference school secondary places. This is also higher than the London average of 66%. This year, the Pan London scheme has reported that Hillingdon has the ninth highest number of applications and preferences for year seven places. This compared to being seventh last year. I should finally add that in the last week, Hillingdon has received 500 in-year or late applications with whom officers are currently working through and although at this time of year there's always a small amount of churn whereby families move in and out of the borough this figure is exceptional however we have got an exceptional admissions team who will painstakingly go over every application thank you thank you for that Councillor McQuarrie do we have a supplementary no Mr Mayor I don't thank you we now go to Councillor Prince. Thank you. Uh, could the Cabinet Member please update us on what additional mental health support the Council has provided to residents as a result of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic? Council Councillor Palmer now. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you to Councillor Prince for your question. I know it's something that you are passionate about. Pre-pandemic estimates were that one in four people experience mental health problems. Reports are that this has increased through the pandemic, which is not surprising. Many existing services stepped up to deal with the influx and new initiatives resulted. The COVID grant has been used to offset additional costs where appropriate, and the response of mental health support should be viewed in the wider context of the Council's COVID response. Adult Social Work Services has maintained statutory services throughout this pandemic, seeing a 137% increase in needs assessments and adult safeguarding inquiries 51% where mental health was the primary reason. We have continued to work with Central North West London Trust, residents being signposted to a single point of access or talking therapies. Referrals have been made to Crisis Home Treatment Team and the Liaison Psychiatry. Extra services were set up by CNWL, including a Mental Health Emergency Access Centre which moved people out of accident and emergency. Working with the council's social work team, the community access service operated a step down house, bridging accommodation between hospital and long term accommodation. A very, very important service. We have continued our su successful voluntary sector <coughs> partnership with commissioning extra services such as mental health employment support. H for All and the Community Hub responded to over 20,000 calls. Mental health needs were signposted onwards to relevant services. Our young people continue to have access to COOTH, a counselling support app. Cabinet agreed in May that the Hillington people would provide information to support the mental health of people under 16. We also supported MIND to switch their therapeutic groups to a telephone support service as their mental first aid calls increased by a staggering 260%. Yes, I agree with whoever did that. 
Our community hub had contacted 28, over 28,000 residents as they were classed as clinically extremely vulnerable. Their mental health needs were assessed at every call. Our library staff phoned residents to help and ensure that they were not left lonely and isolated. Many of us in this chamber collected medicines and food and linked in with our most vulnerable residents once again that, that uh, at least sometimes they saw a friendly face. We have a mental health champion in Councillor Tuckwell who did much and does much to suggest where service delivery can be improved. I look behind. My thanks must go to the social t care team, the senior managers in particular, who ensured that we kept our residents safe. And I must not forget the voluntary sector, whose partnership working was much valued, together with our health colleagues. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do we have a supplementary, Councillor Prince? Uh, I'd like to thank Councillor Palmer for um, that update. One of the biggest causes of poor mental health is problem debt and financial worries. With the government cutting universal credit by £20 per week and the ongoing impact of the pandemic, there is no doubt we will see a rise in people struggling to get by and experiencing poor mental health from financial stress. What action is the council taking to provide specific mental health support for those experiencing problem debt and financial stress as a result of the pandemic? Thank you. We've got there at the end. Councillor Palmer. I understand the point that's being made. The, the services we offer don't discriminate against somebody's mental health. If, if, you, if you experience mental health, we give you support. Uh, such agencies such as the Citizen Advice Bureau will support you with specific areas of debt. This borough works exceptionally well in partnership working. I have every confidence that if the agencies I've spoken about cannot help you, they will support and, and ensure that you get a positive referral to an agency that can. So I, I take the point that's being made, and if Councillor Prince has any specific area that she thinks that we are not uh, working towards, I would welcome the opportunity for her to discuss it with me or the mental health champion who sits behind me. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. We now move on to motions, and I think I, it sounds like I'm going to do my standard speech. Could we please stick to the time limit? You've all practiced it. It's disrespectful to the members, to everybody else that's sitting in the chamber, and for the people who are watching, if you don't abide by the rules. Uh, I will shut you off, pretty sharpish, if we have a repeat of people not sticking to the rules. Okay, so I don't like to play the headmaster, but it is necessary sometimes. Councillor Cawthorn. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, I'm unaccustomed to the luxury of the five minutes afforded to the mover of a motion to council, so you can relax. I won't be extravagant because this is a motion which I'm proud to move this evening, but actually really it speaks for itself. In keeping with our long tradition of meeting such obligations, we welcome Operation Warm Welcome, to which Hillingdon has made a firm commitment. For the best part of 20 years, in one way or another, I was lead member for some of the central services involved in providing support, either as the last chairman of housing uh, way back in 2002 or as cabinet member subsequently. So in a sense, you might say I represent a thread of continuity of our recent history in this respect. Mr. Mayor, few of us, I am sure, can imagine the trauma of having to flee from our home country in fear of our lives and having to make a fresh start elsewhere. But this has been the fate of those Afghans who had previously supported and worked with British service personnel and officials before the recent fall of the government in Afghanistan. It is only right that in Hillingdon, we play our part as part of the wider local government family in helping these people to rebuild their lives in settled accommodation and in time to become full citizens, making a positive contribution to the local economy and the life of our borough, which, with good language skills and employability, they are well placed to do. This is early days, but as the motion points out, we and others 
including London councils, are working with the government to ensure that the funding and working arrangements for Operation More Malcolm are such as to make sure the benefit system is best placed to facilitate this in practice without some of the perverse incentives we sometimes see. Mr Mayor, I know as well as anyone the challenges associated with meeting the demand for housing, and that is true pretty much in whatever local authority in London and the South East you care to name. Reconciling these pressures with the need to meet obligations for those fleeing persecution elsewhere is not easy. But in Hillingdon, looking at the totality of our commitment to people arriving in the UK in need, we should hold our heads high. This includes the support to unaccompanied asylum seeker children. In spite of our well-documented legal challenges over the inequity of effectively having to fund national policy by accident of our status as a port of entry authority, we have not in any way shirked our responsibilities. Delivering on these commitments has and continues to involve a very significant organisational effort across housing, social services and education, alongside existing service pressures, of course, and not to mention our health and voluntary sector partners who are key to all this as well. I think we should take this opportunity to thank our officers across these areas for their endeavours in helping to make this happen. Mr Mayor, it is timely, I think, to restate our commitment, acknowledge our proud history in this regard, and recognise the work of those who, in our name, work to make this a reality. I do hope this motion will attract cross-party support. I move. Thank you. Do you have a second? <laughs> Mr Mayor, I second and reserve my rights. Thank you. Councillor McQuana. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm proud to be the elected member on Hillingdon's Fostering and Permanence Panel, and this evening I wish to share with you, elected members and residents watching at home, just how we support the unaccompanied asylum-seeking children and young people who arrive in our borough. Firstly, to provide some context, the Fostering and Permanence Panel is robust in its scrutiny and in making recommendations on the suitability of foster carers. Our primary focus is to safeguard our looked-after children and young people and to ensure that their voices are heard and their needs are being met. The unaccompanied asylum-seeking children and young people whose cases are heard at panel receive a service that addresses the unique features of their circumstances. For example, English language teaching supports access to therapeutic care, legal aid and an interpreting service to encourage access to provisions that are in line with their cultural and religious identities. As a port authority, Hillingdon supports a disproportionate amount of unaccompanied asylum-seeking children compared to national averages and statutory neighbours. We currently have over 90 in Hillingdon, representing 24% of our looked-after looked children population, and have recently received Afghan children who are in serious danger. In response to this fluctuating and often demanding need, Hillingdon has taken the lead on identifying a named independent reviewing officer, someone who focuses on quality assurance, care planning, and the voice of the young person. This initiative has worked well to provide a swift response to need, a consistent approach, and a proactive response. As a local authority, we have a close working relationship with specialist agencies to uphold our safeguarding duties. These agencies include the UK Border Agency, the Met Police and the Child Trafficking Centre, to name a few. Work is also undertaken with the British Red Cross to help the young people to safely re-establish contact with their birth families and home countries. Where possible, 16 and 17-year-old unaccompanied asylum-seeking young people are housed in semi-independent accommodation with others who share the same culture and language, or in our in-house residential accommodation in Charville. This reduces feelings of isolation and anxiety, making it easier for them to have confidence to integrate into their new surroundings. As corporate parents, we should be proud of the continued achievements of our looked-after children and young people. As I conclude, I wish to share one particular story that recently came to my attention. It's about a boy who arrived in the UK from his native country of Afghanistan, not speaking English but aspiring to become a pilot. Upon arrival to the UK, this young man attended secondary school, progressing on to sixth form and then university, where he undertook a degree in air transport with commercial pilot training. Having now completed this course and obtained his private pilot's license aged 24, he works, for an, he works as a pilot for an airline company. This is just one story that, among many that should make us proud of our continued good practice and strong commitment to all of our looked after children and young people in our borough. Thank you. Councillor Prince. Thank you. Um, I'd like to speak to the amendment on the order paper. 
Mr Mayor, I wholeheartedly support this motion and I will vote for this motion, but I think it can be stronger and I think we as a council can be stronger. The motion fails to recognise the hostile environment that the UK has become and a significant cause of this is down to policy and rhetoric that has come from this government. I understand that this council administration doesn't like lobbying as if it's a dirty word, as if campaigning for better conditions, better support or more resources is something to be ashamed of. But on this issue, it is futile to believe that we can truly ensure a warm welcome without the resources we need from the government to do so, or without the policies from the government that are worthy of a welcoming Britain. We know that not everybody who needed to get out of Afghanistan did so. We saw the footage of people clinging onto planes as they took off, only to then fall hundreds of feet from the plane to the ground. People risked their lives to find safety and security. But under government proposals that are currently going through the House of Commons, an asylum seeker from Afghanistan who has not travelled through what government determined to be a legal route will have their asylum claim deemed inadmissible. And this is a breach of the 1951 Refugee Convention. The government talks about safe and legal routes, but fails to talk about exactly where and what these are and how they can be accessed. Often, asylum seekers do not have time to think or plan. Often, they do not have time or resource to research the specific rules of a safe country that they are travelling to. They just know that they need to leave and be safe and be with their loved ones. And only this morning, the Home Secretary talked about forcing small boats crossing the Channel back to France, a move that is incredibly dangerous, will risk lives, including the lives of children. This government is no friend to asylum seekers. And when people do make it to the UK and claim asylum, what are they met with? Absurdly long immigration processes, unacceptable standards of accommodation, £39.63 per person per week, and that's before we even consider their well-being. The trauma that a person will have gone through will often require physical and mental health treatment. There will be an increased demand on local services. There will be a strain on community cohesion as this demand on services grow. Is this council prepared for that? Has this council even considered that? I support all the aims of the motion, but it doesn't go far enough. The people that hold the power and resource are in Westminster and we need to demand more from them. The government needs to lead the way in creating a genuinely welcoming, safe and streamlined asylum process. Until that happens, I fear every other measure we propose to take will be futile. Let's do more. Thank you. I move. Councillor Nelson. Oh, sorry, is there a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Nelson. Mr. if I could just clarify for members of the chamber, we are now debating the proposed amendment, which is uh, shown third of the way down page four, the bullet point in italics, adding that to the uh, motion. Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I very much regret that this amendment has been put, um, as it's one that the Conservative group are unable to support, and I believe it will put at risk the unanimity of this chamber in support of the Afghan refugees relocating under the Arab process. Our opposition to this amendment rests on two principles. Firstly, this administration will not propose or support motions to council that set out what we are already doing and therefore serve no purpose. For years, this administration has been successfully working with government to secure the resources to enable us to discharge our duties with respect to asylum seekers and refugees arriving at Heathrow Airport. One only needs to look at our track record in receiving and supporting unaccompanied asylum seeking children to know this. And we've already heard that eloquently explained by my colleague. Throughout our lobbying and discussions with government officials and ministers, we have secured change in policy and funding. This amendment very clearly relates to business as usual with this administration and we will have nothing with it. Furthermore, policy is already established with regard to the subject of this motion, the Afghan families. It is called the Afghan Relocation Assistance Policy. And government has announced the funding package to enable local authorities to support families resettling under this policy. The requirement is not for us to petition UK government, but to work in partnership with them to deliver on the undertaking that we as a nation have given them. The second and more important reason, and one that was clearly demonstrated by the discussion and raising of boats in the channel, is that this amendment takes away from a focused motion in support of Afghan locally employed staff and their families and seeks to broaden its scope. Our motion 
one that I hoped the opposition would support without amendment, is expressly in support of those Afghans who served alongside our armed forces, such that their life and that of their families would be at very significant risk if they were to have remained in Afghanistan. It is these loyal people and their families that we will support, and we should not seek to blur the issue or detract from its urgency and importance by widening the motion and thereby opening the door to other considerations. Mr Mayor, we will not support this am amendment. Yeah. Councillor Simmons. Well, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm sure Councillor Prince has learnt from experience that Hillingdon's Conservative administration is always prepared for whatever challenge may come its way. But I don't believe this side of the chamber should take lectures from a party which, in power, made the decision to strip the right to benefits from asylum seekers and refugees for the first time. It's very clear that all parties have played their part in the hostile environment policy. At Hillingdon, Hounslow and Harrow have amongst the highest concentrations of residents with connections to Afghanistan anywhere in the UK. And my parliamentary office, like those of my neighbours, has received many hundreds of inquiries in the last few weeks from residents who are extremely anxious, both about direct family members and people they know in Afghanistan. And we should be proud of the role that's been played by our UK armed forces and diplomats in relocating around 15,000 people to this country already, many of whom have been quarantining in local hotels in Hillingdon as they begin to start their new life here in the UK. So Hillingdon, as it always has with refugee children, as we have heard, has played a significant role in supporting refugees who are coming to our country. But I would like Mr Mayor to very much support what the Leader of the Council has said. I'm aware that he has been extremely active in lobbying government ministers, particularly the Home Office, to ensure that an appropriate financial package is available to support this and other local authorities, work which I've been proud to support him in whenever I can. And it is noteworthy that the resettlement scheme which will be the next phase for a further 20,000 Afghan refugees to come to the UK, has criteria which have yet to be announced, although the Home Office will be doing so shortly, with priority given in particular to women and girls who are at direct risk of violence in Afghanistan since the Taliban take over. And this council and others will be influencing what those criteria are, and will be using those criteria to inform the support that is offered. It will be a very complex process, Mr Mayor. I'm aware in Hillingdon alone we've seen examples of very large and extended families, people seeking to come who may already have had their asylum status refused previously, and that will mean it is not a quick process any more than it was with the Syrian resettlement programme. But Councillor Prince should be assured without the need for this amendment that this borough and this country will continue as it always has been, as a safe haven from those around the world who need the protection of the United Kingdom. Do you have any other speakers on this? Councillor Nelson. No, we haven't voted on the amendment. Councillor Nelson, you reserve your right. If there are no other speakers, then it comes back to you. So it's yours. Start again, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wholeheartedly support this motion. I think we as a council can be stronger. This motion fails to recognize the hostile environment that the UK has become. And a significant, significant cause of this is down to policy and rhetoric that has come from this government. I understand that this council administration does like lobbying as if it's a dirty word, does not like lobbying as if it's a dirty word, as a campaigning for better condition, better support, or more resources is something to be ashamed of. But on this issue, it is futile to believe that we can truly ensure a warm welcome without the resources we need from the government to do so, or without the policies from the government that are worthy of a welcoming Britain. 
We know that not everybody who needs to get out of Afghanistan did so. We saw the footage of people clinging on to planes as they took off, only to then fall hundreds of feet from the plane to the ground. People risk their lives to find safety and security. But under this government proposal that are currently going through the House of Commons, an asylum seeker from Afghanistan on um, acceptable standard of accommodation. The trauma that a person will have gone through, the physical and mental treat, health treatment. Of course, there will be an increased demand on local services and a strain on, on, on local facilities. We as a council, are we prepared for this? I support all the aims of this motion, but it does not go far enough. So please support. Bit delayed. Councillor Hawthorne, you have the right to reply. Do we not vote on the amendment first, Mr. Mayor? Uh, no, the, on a, a discussion on an amendment, uh, once we've come through all the other speakers, the mover of the original motion has the right to reply, and then the mover of the amendment has the right to reply before we go to the vote. Well, I have no uh, desire to prolong this. I think we've had a good discussion. I think we've got a measure of unanimity on, in many respects, I'm disappointed about the direction the amendment has taken us and uh, obviously oppose the motion, uh, the uh, amendment, I should say. Thank you. Councillor Prince. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I would say that I was uh, disappointed, but how can you be disappointed when you never really had any expectations at all? Without this amendment, I fear that this motion is just gesture politics trying to give the impression of doing something when in fact it's weak in substance. And when this borough has some grim examples of how badly asylum seekers are treated on its record, I think that we have a lot to learn. I'm referring to this council arguing that three people who claim to be asylum seeking children and were undergoing an age assessment should be placed in hotel accommodation. The law says that they are children until an age assessment rules otherwise. If this council cannot even get the law right, I have low expectations of the council going voluntarily above and beyond to welcome refugees. This motion talks specifically about Afghan refugees that have been brought through routes facilitated by the government, but we cannot forget about the other asylum seekers from other countries too that haven't been provided with a plane. A plan for asylum and refugees must apply to all asylum seekers and refugees. If that isn't, then the plan isn't good enough. I do wonder what the reason is that this administration does not like making representations to the government. Are they frightened about sticking their head above the parapet? Or is the more likely explanation they are worried about revealing how little influence they actually have? Right, we'll be going for the vote now. Those in favour of the amendment? We'd like a recorded vote. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, required number of members has requested a named vote. Uh, therefore, I will be asking each member in turn if you are voting for the amendment, which is the bullet point in italics shown a third of the way down page four, against the amendment or abstaining. Councillor Ahmad Walana. Against the amendment. Councillor Allen. The amendment. Councillor Arnold. Councillor Barnes. Councillor Bianco. Councillor Birra. Councillor Bliss. Councillor Bridges. Councillor Brightman. Councillor Burrows, Councillor Chapman, Councillor Chubidar, Councillor Cooper, Councillor Cawthorn, Councillor Curling, Councillor Davies, Councillor Dennis, Councillor Deville, Councillor Dillon, Councillor Dot, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Edgington, Councillor Farley, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Gardner, Councillor Goddard, Councillor Hensley, Councillor Higgins, yes. Councillor Lachmana, yes. Councillor Lavery, yes. Councillor Makwana, yes. Councillor Mathers yes. is not here in the room for this one, Councillor Melvin, yes. Councillor D. Mills, yes. Councillor R. Mills, yes. Councillor Money, yes. Councillor Morgan, yes. Councillor Morse, yes. Councillor Nelson, yes. Councillor O'Brien, yes. Councillor Oswell, yes. Councillor Palmer, Councillor Prince, 
Councillor Sir Ray Pottyfoot, yes. Councillor Radia, yes. Councillor Riley, yes. Councillor Rodriguez, yes. Councillor Sansapuri, yes. Councillor Simmons, yes. Councillor Sullivan, yes. Councillor Sweeting, yes. Councillor Tuckwell, Again. Councillor Yarrow, Again. Madam Deputy Mayor, Again. Mr Mayor. Again. Thank you, Mr Mayor. That uh, proposed amendment is lost. We now return to the debate on the original motion, and uh, other, if there are no other speakers, Councillor Edwards reserved his right to speak, and Councillor Cawthorn has a right of reply. Any other speakers? Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. We have all been shocked by the suddenness of change in Afghanistan and the perilous situation that it left very many, and particularly those that served alongside and supported our armed services. I'm also surprised and shocked uh, by the way that what is intended to be a statement of support for people fleeing under those circumstances to be hijacked and uh, distorted by the amendment that has yeah. properly uh, been, been pushed out. We have a moral responsibility to assist those families that are leaving Afghanistan or have left Af Afghanistan having supported the UK armed forces. And I believe that Hillingdon residents want us to offer help. This motion expressly relates to those Afghan families resettling in the UK under the Afghan relocation and assistance policy to those locally employed staff who were at immediate risk in Afghanistan. Ordinarily, the disproportionate burden that this, this administration shoulders in helping and supporting refugees and asylum seekers frames discussions we have with government. However, in these exceptional circumstances, we should set aside that consideration and offer immediate assistance to families arriving under the Arab scheme. In anticipation of support from this chamber, we gave an early undertaking to government to play our part to resettle families in this borough. The details of those families, the number of adults and the children involved, and the timings for their arrival are being determined. Discussions are continuing about other help that we may provide, but now guided by the principle of fairness between authorities. Our motion includes a commitment that we will not put additional pressure on the demand for social housing. We recognize the position of many of our residents and their families coping with inappropriate housing, and we will not add to their burden by using social housing to assist the Afghan families. The funding package provided by government is sufficient for these families to secure private rented accommodation. These are industrious people, willing to have faced risk in their employment in support of our armed forces. And with our support, I am confident they will quickly establish family life in Hillenden and will grow to make a positive contribution to the borough. Mr Mayor, this borough has a proud record of welcoming and supporting the refugees and also of support for our armed services. This motion is in keeping with our history and our values, and I very much hope that it secures unanimous support of yeah. colleagues. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Cawthorn. Mr Mayor, I don't think there's anything I can usefully add to what's already been said, so we'll leave it there. Thank you. So we, here we go for, for the vote and uh, voting for the motion. Show of hands. And those against? The motion is carried. Uh, nine point... Nine point one has been carried held over until the next council meeting. So we move on to nine point two. Councillor Dillon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, both sides over the years have expressed concerns over building control measures, and the Labour Group has put forward a number of uh, motions requesting that we engage with the government so that standards can improve and that there is greater accountability. Now, this is a sensitive subject to talk about but very little has changed if we were to look at the lessons from Grenfell. In my opinion, the government has held up their hands and bailed out developers. The courts have yet to make any decisions, and when we witness the heads of companies like Kingspan squirm away any responsibility, what kind of signal does that send to those in building control? Since the private sector became involved in building control, standards have slipped. And you have to ask the question, why? Is it because the developer is a mate, 
Is it because of competition? And maybe that training is lacking. And it doesn't absolve all local authorities are at fault occasionally. But I do know from conversations that I've had with developers, we have a feared department in Hillingdon. And feared because we're competent, we follow the regs, and we will not pass something that's not within regs. Mr. Mayor, we know that buildings in our borough aren't built to the standards they should be. And there can be no argument there. Councillor Duncan, who's not here, would have mentioned Packet Boat Lane, but there are others. Um, from North Planning many, many years ago, a building, Lisa building in North uh, Ricelip comes to mind. So standards are missed when it comes to fire breaks, fire doors, sprinklers, stairs, windows, not being built to standards. Corners are being cut, and there are private building control companies out there allowing this to happen. I doubt anyone here watches building control videos on TikTok. Just goes to show where my life is at the moment. But the evidence is that what is about what goes on okay, on each occasion and things get passed. I've put myself off now. Want our residents to live in a safe environment. The fact that we have acted to ensure that they do so demonstrates our concerns. As with Packet Boat Lane, we have acted. So why not ask the government to legislate, regulate and strengthen practices within our building control environment? Furthermore, I had concerns, and we all have concerns, with the possible relaxation of planning criteria and permitted development, and the accompanying increase in constructions. That's when everyone becomes a builder, and I fear of new entrants in entering into building control private sector there to make a quick buck. After all, that's how you put your residents first. It's not about politics. I say move. Do we have a second there? Cass Allen. Mr. Mayor, I take no pleasure in what I'm going to say now. And, you know, cast your spurks away, please. I'm supporting this motion tonight because I believe it will bring about some accountability. So I want to tell you what happened to my residents at St George's Court. They came to me in the middle of the Grenfell inquiry because they were trying to seek information over who was doing their building control work. They tried and tried and got nowhere, so then they came to myself and the MP. So I set about trying to find the information they wanted. First I asked the the Council Building Control, who did the work. They told me it was an outside contractor. They had no details of the contractor and therefore they couldn't give any information. I found that incredulous. I, I just didn't believe it, so I kept pushing. And I've got a paper trail of emails asking that question. Who was in charge of building control in George's Court? First, again, I was told, sorry, councillor, we don't keep that information. And I had to go back to them and remind them they do. They have to, by law. But I got nowhere until I said to them, right, I'm going to now... T I've exhausted my patience with you. The residents are suffering. They're not sleeping at night. I am now going to advise those residents to go to the ombudsman because the ombudsman can shine a light where I can't. Well, it was like as if I'd taken a genie out of the bottle. I'd not l long got home to find out the residents said to me, we've got that information and thank you. They should not have been put in that position. Not one of those residents, none of us would want to live how the residents of the George's Court have had to live. They had to, one of them used to stay awake at night while the other slept. That is not, you know, Council Court all might sit there smoking, but that is not the way this council should operate. So I do believe in accountability, and I believe this motion will strengthen it, because if someone actually takes a handle to it, then there should, I believe, be an open register that says, building control for such and such, who they are. The public shouldn't have to trace around 
and officers shouldn't be too frightened to tell the truth. I felt sorry for the officers because nobody wanted to, you know, what was Grenfell was going on and everybody was being, you know, microphone up their noses to turn and say, come on, what do you know about it? I wouldn't want to be an officer in that position, but equally, I wouldn't Thank want to... Thank you, Councillor Allen. Thank uh, you. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lavery. <laughs> Mr Mayor, we can all acknowledge that there are issues with the current system of building control. And indeed, um, in 2020, uh, this council gave a very detailed response to the government consultation on building control and fire safety, which included a number of concerns regarding the role of approved inspectors. Under the current regime, you have a choice of using um, the council service, and clearly we would all like it if people did that, but equally you can approve other, other approved inspectors, some of whom may not be as good as we would all wish. And building control is an issue which has risen um, in the public eye and certainly following um, the Grenville tragedy. The review conducted by um, Dame Judith Hackett um, has now resulted in a building safety bill which is currently uh, has just gone through a second reading in Parliament. As part of this bill, there are detailed provisions in respect of the regulation of the building control profession and the um, expectation is that these will be implemented some 18 months after the bill gains royal consent. I would therefore suggest that further work by the leader and cabinet member um, effectively has all, the work has already been done by this council in 2020, i.e. by predecessors to me, um, and the government is already responding to um, the, the Hackett reports, and I am sure the government will, there will be further responses once the, the result of the Grenville inquiry is known. So whilst we have sympathy with the first paragraph of the motion, um, we will not be supporting um, the suggested action and therefore will not support the motion tonight. Do you have any other speakers on this motion? Councillor Dillon then. <laughs> well, um, no, I appreciate the response. It was a good response and uh, I have a lot of respect for uh, Councillor Lavery um, following many years on North Planning where he was the chairman. Um, it's not what I can say really after following that. Um, Yeah, sit down, really. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we go to the vote then. Uh, voting for the motion, hands, show of hands. And voting against the motion, the motion is lost. We now go to 9.3, Councillor Curling. Thank you, Mr Mayor. The problem of the illegal sale and illegal use of nitrous oxide is a really big problem in our borough. Whether it's Hayes, Ricelet, Uxbridge or Northwood, in our parks and open spaces and streets of our neighbourhoods, wherever you go, you will see the silver canisters and the balloons littering our environment and causing a great deal of distress to our residents. As well as the littering problem caused by the discarded gas canisters and balloons, this illegal activity also leads to antisocial behaviour, with groups of predominantly young people gathering and inhaling the nitrous oxide gas. These gatherings can sometimes make residents feel intimidated and unsafe, and the psychoactive properties of the nitrous oxide can make the users act with very little inhibitions and therefore more prone to acts of antisocial behaviour. Then, of course, there's the added problems of road safety, when the illegal users of nitrous oxide drive, drive whilst under the influence of such psychoactive substance. Mr Mayor, I'm aware that Hillingdon does recognise this problem and have some measures in place to deal with it, such as the Trading Standards Day of Action last September and the inclusion of psychoactive substances in our Public Spaces Protection Order. But I'm sure that every elected member has come across this issue in one way or another, and I'm sure we can all agree that this issue needs more visible action 
to reassure our residents that their council is taking it seriously and doing all they can to tackle it. The Trading Standards Day of Action was great in tackling the illegal sale of nitrous oxide, but surely the great work of our Trading Standards team should be regularly and frequently reported to our residents. The inclusion of the psychoactive substances in our public safety protection order gives us the ability to take enforcement action against those using it. As for the litter problem, well, that's there for everyone to see, and that's definitely a big problem our residents see day in and day out. Nitrous oxide is also called laughing gas. Many other councils, the NHS and Parliament, have all run no laughing matter nitrous oxide awareness programmes. To my knowledge, we have never had such a programme of awareness in Hillingdon. So in summary, Mr Mayor, I move this motion in the hope that it can get unanim unanimously agreed, resulting in Hillingdon committing to an awareness campaign as well as better enforcement action, better investigation of illegal sales and better litter management. All of which would be much appreciated by the residents across the borough and help us, their council, build a better Hillingdon. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Do we have a second there? Council Mathers. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Mr Mayor, I am pleased to second this motion. We as a Labour group are not afraid to have the Council take physical action to solve the problems that residents face. A huge number of residents across this borough have spoken to me about this problem. They've spent a huge amount of time cleaning up their streets and pavements. They've spent a huge amount of their energy and effort trying to discourage it in their pavements, shared driveways, local parks and surrounding roads. I, like them, have spent significant time removing numerous nitrous oxide canisters from my road in front of mine and my neighbour's house. The blight alone frustrates us all. And without direct action, not only the blight, but also the dangers and the health risks will not be challenged. Recreational use of nitrous oxide is a problem, and it needs physical action. This Conservative administration is often shy, nervous, and sometimes unable to lead in taking that action that addresses residents' concerns directly. They prefer to avoid this responsibility and cut corners. This motion is about action, direct action, physical action, using the full resources and powers currently available to the Council, campaigning to raise awareness of the dangers, developing better enforcement action, fully investigating illegal sales, and tackling this as a litter problem. The Labour Group are willing to take physical action direct action for residents, and so does this motion, not a watered-down version. I hope the Conservatives will join us in voting for this motion, a motion that takes action for our residents for a better Hillingdon. I second this motion. Councillor Riley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I rise at this stage to uh, propose the uh, amendment that can be found on page five of the order paper. Hillingdon Council, the police community safety partners, routinely take tough action against the perpetrators of antisocial behaviour and crime. This includes those who sell, give away freely, or consume substances for their psychoactive effect. Nitrous oxide is covered under the Psychoactive Substances Act of 2016. It is illegal to supply the substance for its psychoactive effect. Nitrous oxide is a colourless gas that is most commonly found in pressurised canisters. It is widely available for legitimate uses, such as in the catering industry, and can easily and cheaply be bought online and elsewhere. Some of the harmful effects of inhaling or consuming it are slow cognitive functioning, slow body responses, severe headaches, dizziness, short intensive periods of paranoia, and other effects dependent on the amount taken. In Hillingdon, there are and continue to be a range of targeted actions to address the supply and misuse of nitrous oxide. Working with police and other partners, the community safety team are addressing this issue with the creation of a dedicated group, the Drug Mapping and Vulnerability Group, made up of a wide range of private, public and voluntary agencies locally. This group is responsible for the targeted education and strategic implementation of interventions designed to reduce drug use, including nitrous oxide, given its psychoactive effects. 
The group's objectives are to reduce substance abuse and the harm it causes, especially to the vulnerable. Champion best practice, raise stakeholder awareness of drugs and harmful substances. Provide a resource and advice pool for all Hingerton staff. A natural priority for the group is significant engagement with uh, uh, schools, supporting heads and teachers, working with Safer Schools officers and others to drive home the learning about this harmful substance to our young people. Enforcement is being met by police and our licensing officers and trading standards officers all playing their part. The sale of, of these substances is not license, licensable uh, activity under the Licensing Act, but our teams recognise that if it's being sold on licensed premises, then uh, they make appropriate re references to the police. Similarly, our trading standards officers are in the mix as well, uh, and all our staff work quickly to remove canisters when they are reported. Mr Mayor, Hillingdon is doing a great deal to counteract this, the use of this harmful substance. I commend this uh, amendment to the Chamber. Do we have a second, Councillor Dennis? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I, I wish to second the amendment. Um, this is a growing problem, and I'm sure that we all in the Chamber are aware of this. Council is, and officers are doing a lot, as Councillor Riley said. Of course, we always need to look how we can do more, and we also need to look at what's happening nationally, what we can learn there. In drugs terms, this is a relatively new problem, so there's a lot for us to learn. The law needs to be looked at as well. I welcome the national review. There appears to be gaps in the legislation, and our enforcement agencies need more powers. But what's important is that policing and ABS strategies operate within the legal framework. If you don't do that, you don't get community support, and you don't get credibility from those who, who you're trying to tackle the issue with. I support Councillor Riley's amended motion because it deals with the important issue, but it also deals with the importance of dealing with, with, with this issue within the legal framework. Mr Mayor, if I may, for the clarification of members, we are now into the debate on the proposed amendment, which, as Councillor Riley indicated, is shown on the lower half of page 5 and just on the top of page 6. Two speakers uh, indicated to speak on the main motion, Councillors Hensley and Allen. If you wish to speak on the amendment, which we're now debating, you'll need to indicate again. Okay, both on the amendment then, sir. Councillor Hensley. Uh, uh, Mr Mayor, I, I welcome this opportunity to, to talk about uh, the misuse of drugs. I personally have seen so many lives ruined and family lives disrupted through the use of drugs. The law as it stands is very vague regarding uh, drugs and motorists. I have witnessed uh, people taking this no uh, nitrous oxide whilst at the will. The trouble is, it's very difficult to take a prosecution here. But with, with its alcohol, it's very clear. You take a breath test, if it goes red, you're taken to the police station and you have to breathe in through a calculated uh, air monitor and it's, very, it's prescriptive and that then goes to the court. If it's 36 milligrams per litre under breath, you are convicted. If it's 35, you walk home free. With its drugs, that's not the case. You have to, the first of all, the police have to make sure that you are impaired in driving. The police then have to take you to a police station and the police surgeon has to come and take a blood test. And then, depending on the results of that blood test, do they take it further? And it's for the prosecution to show that the drugs actually impaired the driving. Now, that's the bit that worries me. The psycho um, uh, uh, corrective substance, the law was modified, and it came in effect on the 1st of April 21. In possession, the starting point is one month custody, but it's for, it goes from a fine to three months. And I can tell you now, the courts will normally be sending the custody. It would be a suspended pres uh, sentence because the court that the, the, the prisons are full. There is a problem. It only becomes a criminal offence if you are having this substance, if you are in a prison. Obviously, supply is a different matter, and the, and the, the maximum there is seven years. My concern here with this type of drug, it's a gateway now into other use, uh, forms of drug taking. And I'd like to thank to Ray here, because he helped me when I launched your life, your choice. And Councillor Curling, for your information, 
I, together with the Metropolitan Police, for many, many years, have, have gone into every secondary school in this borough and looked at, and we have made them aware of the taking of drugs, the implications of drugs, and knife taking. Over 6,000 of our secondary schools, youngsters have had my exposure, as it were, to the taking of drugs. I also, under the Ministry of Justice, opened up a drug rehabilitation unit. My wife and I were invited. I was very apprehensive because you know, they never quite know what you're going to walk into. But obviously, uh, it, my fears were mislaid because two individuals came up to me, and I won't use the words they used, but you're the individual that sent me the custody. One was thank you, Councillor Hensley. Your time is up. Okay, thank you much. Councillor Allen. It, we are debating the amendment, so if you wish to speak on the amendment, now is the time. Here we go. Mr Mayor, silver bullets, as they are known, or laughing gas, are sadly reality, not laughing matters. They bring distress. The only people who are making a profit here, or getting any real fun out of them, is the shops and the, the web. It is our communities that pick up the real tab because the users invariably end up at the doctors, hospitals, which stretch our services even further. I know we've had discussions on this before. Excuse me, I've got an abscess, so you'll have to bear with me. I know we've had this discussion before, but is this council really listening? I've listened to what's been said and you know, I'm being told, oh, we're doing this and we, we've got all these people. But go out in the streets and really see what's going on out there. Because I think you'd get a surprise. Not a good one. Tower Hamlets has banned the usage. Why haven't we? Now, we can wait for the government to fuff around and decide whether, what it's going to do. But our residents at the moment demand action now. And many of them will probably be listening tonight or on the phone to us councillors tomorrow to ask what this council's doing. I want to be able to say this is a listening council, not one that buries its head in the sand and waits for uh, some government or um, minister to turn around and decide what he's doing. I want action now. So Councillor Curling's recommendations tonight could be implemented quickly. And then you can have your government sit around the table and decide what they're going to do. But don't leave the residents tonight with empty words. They demand action. Your children, if you've got children, will be picking up those silver canisters. There are over 30 families who've been grieving because their children are dead through silver canisters. Can you or I afford to wait longer while you have a chat about it? No. There's a helpline out there, and as I say, I'll give off to it later. But please, you've got the chance to do something. You can kick this into the long grass tonight, or you can go to some funerals soon. Thank you. Councillor Dillon. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, just a couple of points. Um, one is on this being a new problem, as Councillor Dennis said. I, I'm not aware of it being a new, new problem to me would be one or two years. This has been going on for eight, ten years. Um, it takes place mostly by people parked up on a road, cul-de-sac, um, and they just dump it. So why the pol I would like some numbers on who the police have actually caught, um, because it seems to be a growing problem, and there seems to be no deterrent. So if they've actually caught somebody, why not publicise it? They can't catch people speeding, in my experience. So how are they going to catch these guys? They, they constantly moan that there's not enough people. Most of the activity takes place at night. I, I just don't see what the police are doing about it. Um, so I'd like some numbers on it. I don't believe it's a new problem. It's been going on a very, very long time, and I think it's taken us quite a long time over many group meetings to bring it to council. Um, we know and we have the knowledge of where it takes place, so increased police will... The government have been, uh, promised us more police, and I haven't seen that come through. But as a cyclist, 
you try riding down a road when it's dark. Sometimes you can see them, sometimes you can't. And then you swerve out, and you can get hit by a car. Runners, we've got more people running on the roads now after the pandemic. Sometimes they run on the road, uh, on the road or the pavement, but they're there. They can slip over Britain. Short-sighted people, people who suffer from sight issues. There's a threat there. And the worst thing was when I, my daughter the other day said to me, what are those things? What do people, why do they leave them on the street there? She's 10. I'm like, they're used for making cakes. But what, what do you say? And I've, I had no answer. It's a growing problem. It needs addressing. Okay, the government may do something, but we can do something. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Sansapuri. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I am against this amendment because it removes all the direct ac actions and responsibility from the Council. The direct creation's use of nitroxide is growing concern for Hillingdon. There have been recent reports in the, uh, reports in the press regarding Hillingdon <laughs> resident distress at the finding balloons, canister and other rubbish in their neighborhoods. This shows it is a problem for our is on our doorstep and residents are growing concerned about it. However, while the rubbish and antisocial behavior affect everybody in the community, the most concerning thing is impact on the safety of young people. Whilst data from 2018 shows 2.3 percent of those aged between 16 to 59 had tried nitro oxide in the past 12 months, the figure for those aged between 16 to 24 was 8.7 percent. Both figures have grown since 2012. This problem is on the rise. First, there is awareness problem. Many young people see this drug as a safer alternative to alcohol and other drugs, but there are many risks. Use of nitrous oxide can lead to lack, lack of oxygen to the brain, which, co which causes causing unconsciousness and even death. Regular use is linked to deficiency of vitamin B12, which can cause nerve damage. Headache and dizziness are common. There is a supply problem. We need to commit a better enforcement and tackling illegal sales. And last but not the least, we need to deal with the littering and antisocial behavior that accompany this problem. Mr. Mayor, I believe we must act now to stop this becoming a larger problem for Hillington. I believe it is in our residents' interest to not to wait until this problem grow further. I urge everybody to support, again, uh, sorry, to vote against this amendment. Thank you. Do we have any other speakers on this? Councillor Douglas Mills. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but I feel it is right not just only to support the amendment, which reiterates the importance of the continuing work that has been done in the past and the need to do more. And we do accept that these are problems which do cause lots of concerns to residents and indeed great frustrations to many of the agencies as well, because a lot of it is not easily uh, resolvable overnight. However, what I take particular concern about from here in the debate tonight is two things. One, um, members of the Hillenden Labour Group getting up and reading their prepared speeches, come what may, regardless of whether it's on the amendment or not, and totally ignoring the fact of the work that has gone on to date to try and deal with what are very difficult issues. And the second one is the emphasis that the Hillenden Labour Party are going to take direct action, implying that this council has done nothing over the years. Can I suggest as the longest serving councillor on this uh, authority, that some of the newer councillors may actually get more out of all this if they have these issues, either to raise it directly with the cabinet member, ask a question in council, or even use the processes of this council and use the select committees that we have to say, is this an issue we need to have a greater understanding of? Because at least then they would come into this chamber armed with information about what is being done rather than the ignorance of nothing's being done and we will solve it all ourselves. That kind of cooperation may actually reveal areas where further work is necessary 
or would be beneficial and further work with our partners could be elaborated to try and solve some of these deep-rooted issues. So I'm getting a bit annoyed by this thing that the Labour Party feel we've raised an issue and only we can solve it, when in reality this council is already dealing with very difficult issues and is trying to find ways with our partners to solve the problems that clearly do exist. And I think that approach is a more joined up, a more mature and a more experienced way that councillors should approach these kind of issues. Do we have any other speakers? No? Councillor Curley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, b before I read my prepared speech that I prepared earlier, <laughs> um, perhaps I can address some of those last comments. Um, I mean, in, in, in my original speech, I did mention that the Council was doing a lot of these things, like the, the great things that the um, trading standards team are doing, but we don't, uh, we don't trumpet that enough, we don't publicise that enough, and I find it bizarre that anything that's in a motion that the administration is doing, they, they take out of the motion or vote against. How can they vote against their own actions? Perhaps they don't trust their own actions. Anyway, back to the prepared speech. <laughs> whilst, whilst the Labour group welcomes the Home Secretary's recent announcements of a review on this matter, we do feel that the amendment effectively nullifies the actions that we think the Council should be taking. It is regrettable that the Conservative amendment removes the words huge amounts when referencing the problem of the littering of silver canisters and balloons. This is small but significant amendment of the motion's wording shows just how out of touch the Conservative group are with the concerns of our residents. The Labour group has spent the summer listening to the concerns of our residents across the borough and whether it's residents in Northwood Hills, Ryslip Manor, West Ryslip, Ickenham, South Ryslip, Hillingdon East, Brunel, Uxbridge South or any of the Hayes wards, nitrous oxide and the huge amounts of silver canisters and balloons that litter those areas is a massive concern to our residents. The substantial part of the Conservative Amendment goes on to re remove any action, whether proactive or reactive, that the Council could take in order to tackle these issues that the residents across the borough have raised. Considering the time it will take for the Home Office review to be conducted, recommendations put together, then the parliamentary process and time required to bring all of that into force, this amendment effectively commits the Council to do nothing and in the meantime, nothing to address the immediate concerns of the residents. Had the amendment added working with the government and other agencies, blah de blah de blah we could have accepted it as a friendly amendment, but by removing any commitment to do any better for our residents now, we simply cannot accept it. Indeed, we consider the removal of any action by the council as a dereliction of duty. Mr Mayor, previous Conservative administrations did listen to the residents and did work cross-party and proactively on issues like the cat houses that we used to suffer with. Indeed, it was the proactive and cross-party action of Hillingdon that drove a great deal of the government action on classifying cat as a Class C drug. So it's a pity and regrettable that the current Conservative administration is not willing to listen to the residents and use their significant powers to actually do something about this borough-wide Thank issue. you, Councillor Curling. <laughs> Councillor Riley. <laughs> Councillor Riley. Well, thank you, Mr Mayor. And having heard uh, what I have from the opposition, I can do no better, perhaps, than echo what the leader said earlier on. These are matters, as I set out in my speech earlier, that are taking place now, that we are dealing with, that we're very, very well aware of. Uh, and indeed, uh, speaking only today with senior police partners, they are very well aware of. In August of this year, they launched a specific targeted action in regard to drivers under the influence of substances not controlled under the Misuse of Drugs Act, but other such substances like nitrous oxide. Not, 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 nitrous oxide. So um, things are being done uh, across the board in relation to not only the police but our own enforcement agencies uh, and things will continue to be done. Things can always be done better or further but uh, what this amendment does is to set out a realistic and proper position uh, and I ask everyone to support it. 
now go to the vote. Uh, for those in favour of the amendment, please show of hands. They're taking in turns. Yeah, yeah. Those, thank you, uh, those voting against the amendment, the amendment is carried. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That amendment is carried. That becomes a substantive motion shown at the bottom of page five and the top of page six, to which further amendments may be moved. If there are none, then we go to the vote. Is that agreed? Agreed. Go to agenda item 10. Adjournment date, uh, Councillor Mathers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I receive constant complaints from residents from across the borough, from West Drayton to Ryslip and beyond, about litter. Not just its presence, but the council's lack of coordination to deal with it. People want to be proud of their homes. They want clean, clean streets and clear environmental and health damage, dangers that litter cause they want rid of. Parents don't want to have to worry about their children playing outside in our green areas because it's covered in litter. High streets across the borough are regularly seen in the sorry, sorry state, especially as I approach the Civic Centre from West Drayton. It attracts pests and rodents, although after our last adjournment at eight, I'm sure the Conservatives will absolve themselves of responsibility once more. It's the basic responsibility of the Council to ensure we have clean streets, and I truly hope they acknowledge there is a litter problem on our streets during this debate. It is clear what the problem stems from. There are some small things that can be done to change this through coordination. Split bags on the roadside um, from our rubbish collection days. When the litter pickers have already been, rather than them following afterwards to pick things up, at, which leaves our roads full of waste and forcing residents to clean the streets themselves. Our council bins overflowing in the evenings and the weekends by most bus stops and litter just flows down the street. A lack of coordination between council services uh, when the grass is cut, meaning the litter being picked up not before but after the grass is cut, the plastic has been shredded and stuff is everywhere. Residents are fuming about this. They're constantly sick of the lack of basic coordination where if we collect the litter first and then the grass is cut, we don't harm as much wildlife and it isn't such an eyesore. There has been constant cutting of our litter services budgets and we can see where this blame comes from. It's the Conservative government, successive of them, that have cut 60 pence out of a pound for local authorities since 2010. And we would welcome this Conservative administration joining us in the condemnation of this Conservative government's lack of funding for local authorities. Hillenden can be better, and Hillenden residents deserve better, both in local and national government. However, I am grateful for those litter services and officers that do collect. And I am very grateful to Hillings and Litter Pickers and other groups who have taken this to themselves. It's sad that they have to watch an idle Conservative administration in this council be detached from reality. Let's be clear, Hillings and residents have noticed a decline in this service and they will remember, Hillings and residents deserve better and they will get better with a Labour-run Hillings and Council. <laughs> I'll ask the question. Are there, are there any other speakers? Mr Mayor, just to clarify, although the names of the proposed speakers are down the list, you do have to indicate if you're going to speak. Councillor Dillon. Okay. Um, Mr Mayor, this has been a widespread problem for our borough, and it's the most reported ME, and it's what keeps our street champions busy. And it's a constant source of complaint for our residents. For those in the north, the hours after the bin bags are collected. For those in the south, there are similar issues, but additionally, street bins are overflowing, resulting in rubbish spread across our streets. I've been constantly requesting for bins along North Hyde Road to be emptied on a Friday, but nothing has happened. If we were to walk through Hayes Town, you'd, see, you'd not see a pretty picture with large amounts of litter. It's a problem across the entire borough. I recently visited Ryslip, Eastcote and Ickenham. After spending what seems to be, <laughs> and manner, after, what's, after spending what seemed like most of my adult life stuck in a traffic, line, traffic jam along Long Lane, I couldn't help but notice the awful state of our road verges and our green spaces. As Councillor Mathers said, constant 
government funding cuts and constant conservative council service cuts have brought us to this point. What we want is residents to be proud to live in Hillingdon, but that's a little bit difficult when the streets are full of litter. Council, councillors and street champions are reporting litter, clearly, but this isn't enough. If it wasn't for our voluntary groups and our residents who have taken it upon themselves to clean our streets, we'd be in a much worse position. I'm sure that I speak on the behalf of the council when I thank them for their work, but is it what we expect from our council tax paying residents? Will we be expecting residents to get their lawn mowers out and cut the grass in our green spaces? <laughs> Councillor Goddard, that's a joke. <laughs> Not for your budget. <laughs> in February. Hillingdon litter pickers, we applaud you for your efforts. I think the Pinkwell councillors would like to thank Julie and Gerard. And we now have a Hayes Cultural Society, Green Picking Pinkwell Park. So well done to all the colleagues who litter pick whilst on their ward rounds. Litter is a constant issue across the borough and it's shameful that the council is unable to do more to fix this problem, relying on the kindness of residents to make up the council's inactivity. I'd very much urge committees officers and all councillors to engage so that we can have clean streets that we will aspire to. Councillor Bridges. Mr Mayor, in October 2020, the Cabinet was presented with findings from the Rees Pox major review into littering and fly tipping. Of course, I'm sure Councillor Mavis is aware of that as he too was one of the members like myself who helped form those recommendations. The findings resulted in a 48-page report containing recommendations for improvements based on thorough scrutiny and contributions from members, officers and external witnesses. This is a robust and effective process that allows members to contribute and debate policy. And indeed, the same would be said had this topic been uh, raised this evening by way of a question to the Cabinet member or a motion to Council, as mentioned at my last Council meeting. Whilst the subject of litter is an important one, I'm rather bemused as to exactly what Councillor Mavis hopes to achieve this evening by submitting an adjournment debate where no vote is taken, no questions are officially answered and no agreed action can be taken. So once again, Mr Mayor, with a lot of talk and very little action, this is simply the Labour Group's attempt at virtual signalling and failing to provide the ideas or actions that will support the residents of this bar. Councillor Richard Mills. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'd like to praise the work of solo street sweepers across our town centres and residential areas. However, the correct forum to deliver real outcomes and benefits for our residents is our cross-party select committees. As Councillor Bridges referred to, this is what's been done previously and delivers tangible results. Councillor Tuckwell. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I would like to endorse the comments and points raised by both Councillor Bridges and Councillor Richard Mills. I do, however, feel that Councillor Mathers and the Labour Group need to reflect upon how important topics are raised for debate and to be mindful that there are political procedures such as full council motions, full council questions to cabinet members or an agenda topic at our select committees. I'd like to point the Labour Group towards our prescribed political systems that make good use of this chamber's time and to, to recognise there are vast amounts of topics covered, particularly in our select committees, that already create scrutinised actions and activities that serve our residents. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yeah. Thank you for that. And before I close the meeting, after close to two, and a half, two, two hours of debate and discussion, I would like to welcome everybody back to the Mayor's Parlour for uh, a little bit of refreshments and maybe some more discussion. I formally close the meeting.